Well, welcome back everyone. So now we're going to start the session of good practice from practitioners. As yesterday, we we're hoping that this is going to be really insightful also uh, to have this experience uh, from the ground. So I'd like to first invite Enrico Misasi, who is a member of the Federal Chamber of Deputies here in Brazil. So please, Enrico, you have the floor for the next 15 minutes to share our thoughts. And also, thanks for joining us today. Please. Hi, uh, Rodolfo, everyone that is here in this, uh, in this day, I would like to, to thank um, for the invitation and I hope, uh, I am certain that I will learn a lot today and will be able to exchange experiences and thoughts. I, uh, so good afternoon to everyone. Actually, good morning here from Brazil, Rodolfo. Uh, it is a, a truly honor to be part of such an important event uh, that unites people from all over the world to reflect on a, an, a, an urgent and fundamental aspect of uh, for the development of nations, I think. And I would like to, uh, to greet you, Rodolfo Canonico, and I, I don't know if, if I am pronouncing correctly, and Heba Alfara, uh, which is my colleague here, uh, today and in the person of Professor Inácio Socias, I would like to greet the, the entire International Federation for Family Development as an institution. And I want to public, publicly acknowledge uh, the, the exceptional work that has been done at uh, the international level and also here in Brazil. So I, I would like to, uh, I will have to apologize in advance also for my absolutely rusty English. So as, as Rodolfo said, I am Enrico Mizazi, I am uh, a lawyer and I have a master's degree in constitutional law. And currently uh, I am a congressman here in, the, in Brazil in the Chamber of Deputies in the, the Federal Congress. Well, I'm married and I am expecting my, my first child in December. And I think it is important to say for this moment, I am 26 years old, which means that the topic of youth transition, yeah, the topic at hand is not something foreign for me or distant, quite the opposite. Um, I'm not an expert on youth transition policy and many in this event will bring us technical knowledge, scientific research, scientific data, intellectual arguments and perspectives. Uh, but I, uh, being a politician, I must speak here based on what I, what I think are two starting points. Uh, first of all, I must speak based on the situation here in Brazil. Uh, as you all might know our country is one of unparalleled uh, natural wealth with wonderful people and countless opportunities but also uh, with a huge uh, with huge social issues social problems uh, it, we are a developing country that still deals with extreme poverty with illiteracy at mm, unacceptable rates with a lack of basic infrastructure in sanitation, for example, and with, not, uh, with the notorious favelas, which are worldwide known, which do deprive millions of Brazilians of the basic conditions to a good and to a healthy life. And this picture of social issues, social problems, obviously affects intensely young people as they enter adulthood. Violence, Drugs, uh, lack of professional qualification, professional skills are a reality for many young people. Uh, many others live in a, in a situation for which we have even given a, a nickname. Uh, in Portuguese, we say name name. That is young people who neither study nor work, 
not because of their own will, but because we are failing to give them the opportunities. Uh, in other words, our youth transition policies are failing to give them the opportunities and the skills uh, that the youth transition requires. Second, I would like to speak uh, based upon my own experience. And I, here I have to, to, to make an explanation. Uh, in a country with many social problems, I was born into a quite, let's say, privileged family. That is, in a stable family, financially well off, with, with seven children, I am the, uh, the oldest, in the economic capital of the country, Sao Paulo. Uh, I had access to a great public university, the, be the best in the country, because, my, because, and that is important, because my parents could afford private schools in my childhood. I had parents who had and have parents who provided and provide a stimulating and rich environment of relationships. Uh, that means I received a lot from my family and from society as well, which was essential to getting where I am today. Uh, so I think our mission and my mission as a, as a legislator, as a policy maker, must be to extend to all young people as much as possible uh, what, has, what I was open-handedly given without merit, merits uh, of my own. And reflecting on this, I would like to propose uh, the following thesis, that the central challenge that, policymaker, uh, that, a, that a policymaker faces regarding youth transition is that the growing independence from the original family, from family, which must occur, should arise simultaneously with an effective integration of young people in the community, in the expanded community and in society. It is necessary to, to clarify uh, these terms I, I used. Independence from family means, as I see it, the acquisition of the necessary skills for adult life, including not only emotional capabilities and emotional skills, but also professional and uh, financial ones. Integration of young people in the expanded community means, as I see it, first of all, the establishment of healthy social bonds and effective insertion in the labor market. It seems to me considering all of this, that we should act on two types of public policy. The first one, uh, I don't know how to call it, but I will call it prior, previous or early public policies must be carry out, carried out uh, necessarily before the youth transition phase. And the other one is what happens and must be carried out on the actual youth transition. The first type of public policy uh, starts from a premise that for me is absolutely essential, that youth transition is a long process and that the skills it requires are developed, uh, are developed in the beginning of life and in all childhood. It is not something that can be improvised. In this sense, we can establish four subtypes of these previous or even better early public, public policies. Four subtypes. The first of them, investment in early childhood. It is extensively documented that early childhood, that is the age from zero to six years old, as our legislation, legislation here in Brazil, establishes is a crucial moment for the development of any person. The right stimuli and the uh, an environment of love, a caring nursery environment are essential. Therefore, public policies aiming at youth transition should seek to ensure in early childhood access to daycare centers and to prevent uh, exposure to violence, for example. 
second subtype, uh, policies that aim uh, the soundness and stability of family bonds. Because healthy youth and a healthy youth transition depends to a large extent on a healthy childhood. And for a healthy childhood, uh, the strength and stability of family bonds are necessary. Public policies must focus on strengthening those bonds, especially in the most socially vulnerable families. And here, uh, it is absolutely necessary to overcome uh, the, the prejudice or the paradigm uh, that family is something that concerns individuals in their private lives and therefore the state should not worry nor interfere. But it's quite the opposite. What happened within families has a huge social impact on the common good. Thus, the state must not overlap, obviously, but assist families in their own mission to educate. Which brings us to the third subtype of public policy, uh, which is teaching the right parenting skills to parents. A great deal of work to be done is teaching the parents the necessary parenting skills for their children's education. The benefits of the right parenting style in the development of children and young people are countless, and Professor Socias taught me that. And the state must support parents in this regard. And the fourth subtype of these early policies is providing uh, and assuring a basic education system that actually provides the necessary knowledge to children. And so there must be a serious policy of providing placement in child care centers for children so that they learn how to read and how to write within the correct time frame and so that they learn the necessary skills and they properly socialize in the right age. So investment in early childhood, soundness and stability of family bonds, teaching the right parenting skills to parents and a basic education system that provides the knowledge to children. And the second type of public policy for youth transition occurs, uh, uh, must be carried out during the actual transition period. And uh, their effective outcome depends in a large extent on the effectiveness, uh, sorry, on the effectiveness of early public policies. And this category can also be divided into four subtypes, as I see it. First of all, first of all, providing access to a high to higher education, and for me the case is uh, the case of Brazil is one of particular concern. Uh, public universities here in Brazil are highly sought after and generally attended by people who, like me, I'm talking about my experience, like me, had access to a private education, uh, uh, private basic education, right? Uh, public higher education is thus, here in Brazil, restricted to an elite, exclu excluding a large part of Brazilian youth and creating uh, inequalities. So we have to provide access to higher education. Second, public policy. We have, uh, here in Brazil, we call it uh, literally uh, professionalizing education, uh, ensino profissionalizante. I don't know if we can say vocational education, something like that. That alongside higher education, there is a need for policies that foster uh, what we call this professionalizing vocational education in, in which young people can learn the necessary knowledge and skills for professional life. So higher education, universities and vocational or professionalizing education. Third, effective policies for first jobs. Here in Brazil, we have this, this, this concern, this uh, policies that target access to a first job uh, are for me especially important. Uh, the youth should be assisted in finding their first employment uh, to begin their professional lives. 
high levels of unemployment affect particularly young people here in Brazil and also in Europe and all over the world. And, and what is, is, uh, we must address is that late start into a professional life is absolutely harmful and must be avoided. And so uh, a public policy to youth transition man, must address uh, this issue, this topic. And the fourth subtype of public policy is to foster and to encourage and to uh, a good network of healthy interactions with the community, with associations, churches, clubs. Uh, the integration of young people into society depends deeply on the quality of the social bonds they establish outside their families with members of their expanded community. Thus, uh, policies should encourage and not hinder the creation and development of civil associations and other socialization environments for young people to establish and to cultivate community relationships. Therefore, it seems to me in conclusion uh, that public policies aimed at the youth transition must have a um, comprehensive approach looking at the development of young people from the beginning of life. Each country must, of course, uh, take into account uh, the specifics of its situation, but these eight uh, subtypes, sub, uh, categories of, poli uh, of public policies uh, are those, I think, as a politician, as a, as a policymaker, that I think are absolutely important and central to public support for youth transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrico, for your thoughts. We appreciate a lot. Hope you can join us in the Q&A short after the next talk. So I would like to give the floor to Ms. Heba Alfara who is family, office, family Policy Officer at the Doha International Family Institute and alumni of the International Advocacy Workshop 2018. Yep, also that's where, uh, yeah. That's and where we, we met. I, yeah, that's where yeah. we met the first time. So I'm very happy to see you again. And, and well, now you have 15 minutes to share your thoughts with us. Thank you awesome. very much for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rodolfo. And uh, thank you so much to Ignacio and Alex for inviting me over to speak and uh, for inviting the Institute to speak. So thank you to IFFD. Um, I have a presentation prepared, but I don't know how I'm going to be sharing it. So how do I do this? <laughs> you, you, have a, a, you can share your, your screen or screen? some of us. Yeah, you can share oh, if, yeah. you, if you prefer that. Actually, Ignacio is sharing the presentation. Okay, cool. He'll give control to you so you can control it. Great. See, technology at work, people. There. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> okay, cool. You can control. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's go back. Oops. Sorry about that, just, uh, okay, cool. Okay, awesome. So uh, yeah, as Rodolfo said, my name is Heba Alfara and I work for the Doha International Family Institute. And uh, I'm so happy to be here and uh, reconnecting with some of my, uh, my friends and hopefully future friends uh, over here at the uh, IAW. So that's awesome. I'm going to be presenting today on the impact of parenting on youth transitions. So, okay, clicked. Okay, cool. So what am I going to be talking about today? Uh, first off, I'm going to introduce the organization that I work for at the Doha International Family Institute, DIFI. And then I'm going to be delving into parenting and parenting programs. And then I'm going to give a little bit of detail about DIFI's report on parenting programs in the Arab region. And then I'm going to be looking at the impact of parenting on youth transitions and leaving you with a few recommendations uh, for you guys to think about and, uh, you know, be critical about. Okay, great. So the Doha International Family Institute was established in 2006. 
It is a global policy and advocacy institute that works to advance knowledge on Arab families and promote evidence-based policies. Diffie's mandate is based on the Doha Declaration on the Family, which reaffirms the commitments of the international community to strengthen the family as the natural and fundamental group unit of society and encourages governments, international organizations, and members of civil society to take action to promote and support the family. Bear with me for these pauses because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm shifting from slide to slide. All right, so the one second. So the mission of, oops, sorry about that. Oops, skipping. Okay, so Diffie's mission is to strengthen the Arab family through research, policy, outreach, and advocacy at the national, regional, and international levels. It also has a special consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC. And it works on specific strategic priorities, including family cohesion, family well-being and protection, marriage and divorce, parenting and behavioral issues. In fact, uh, next year in uh, February, we will be hosting a, uh, a conference, an international conference on marriage. So uh, you are all more than welcome to, uh, to, to join. So please, I would invite you to look at our website. I'll definitely leave a link at the end. All right, so let's get into the topic. What is parenting? Parenting is a series of interactions, behaviors, emotions, beliefs, knowledge, attitudes, and practices that all work toward, uh, together towards nurturing care. Nurturing care here, uh, we understand it as everything to do with caring for a child, including nutrition and health and security and safety and early learning as well. But what is positive parenting? Positive parenting focuses on creating safe home environments and builds a foundation of support and care for them, for children. But how does it do that? It does that through nurturing parenting and positive discipline. In this case, nurturing parenting is about helping children to develop healthy behaviors, life skills, and well-being. Whereas positive discipline focuses on praising, rewarding, and supporting good behavior as opposed to using physical punishment. So what is the role of parents in parenting? It is the parents or caregivers duty to prepare their children for the physical, psychological, and economic conditions in which they flourish. So it's a duty over here. And it involves the involvement and participation of parents and caregivers in the life of their children. And this affects their growth, their development, and their success in terms of improving education and health outcomes, promoting gender equality, and preventing the reproduction of vulnerability. So why is parenting so important? The role of parents in achieving child well-being has been highlighted in international documents such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which obligates states to render appropriate assistance to parents and legal guardians in the performance of their child-rearing responsibilities and shall ensure the development of institutions, facilities, and services for the care of these children. As such, support for parents in parenting has been a focus of family policies around the world. And one of these policies is parenting programs. So what are parenting programs? They are interventions or services designed to support parental care interactions, behaviors, knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, and practices. In fact, positive parenting is at the core of parenting programs that support parents and caregivers. Positive parenting as well, positive parenting practices are also important across the life cycle of the child. So again, parenting programs help children, help, sorry, help parents and caregivers to manage children's behavior, offer alternatives to physical punishment, um, understand children's development, improve parent-child communication, which is a protective factor against violence, teach children skills such as emotional regulation and problem solving, and help children build resilience and avoid experiencing or even perpetuating violence. So why are, again, so why are parenting programs so important? A World Bank report in 2015 showed that investments in early childhood in the Middle East and North African region are among the lowest in the world. As such, investing in high quality parenting programs is an important element of national policies and social investment packages aimed at building human capital of the next generation, 
breaking the intergenerational cycle of poverty, reducing social exclusion and violence, decreasing inequalities, and promoting the successful development of children and adolescents. Which brings me to Diffie's report on parenting programs in the Arab region, which was created to provide a survey and a description of the different parenting programs across the Arab region. It provided the challenges that they were facing, and it looked also on the gaps. The report found that there are 108 parenting programs across the Arab region, 38 in the Arab Mashraq, 32 in the Arabian Gulf, 26 in the Arab Maghreb, and 12 programs in the less developed countries. The report found that parenting programs in the Arab region target families, individuals, and communities, as well as targeting all three at the same time in mixed groups. The type of programs that were explored included parental education, parental support, parental training, and parental interventions. I'm gonna delve a little bit deeper into these different kinds of parenting programs. So first and foremost, parental education. This involved the knowledge transfer, the awareness of childhood characteristics and parental care. It was more about teaching parents these types of skills and giving them knowledge. Whereas parental support involved psychological support, family relations, social care, and support for families with children with disabilities. Parental training, however, talked about parental integration, care mechanisms and methods. Here, giving them actual life skills that they can use. And parental interventions involved psychological and educational counseling, as well as family conflict resolution sessions and tips and tricks. In addition, the report found that there were some good practices when it came to parenting program evaluation. It found that early intervention is more effective than delayed intervention. So the earlier we start, the better the outcomes. Intervention should be based on theory and models, things that have worked in the past. Concrete, they should also involve concrete and measurable interventions, things that we can measure, things that we can learn from so that we can keep improving them for future, uh, for future reference. In addition, parenting program evaluation has showed that interventions must be targeted. Intervention is also concerned with implementation and service accessibility. In addition, quality staff needs to be involved in these interventions as well as using interactive and practical materials to make sure that people are engaged with the material and that they can use them. Also, long-term funding for sustainable interventions is a necessary issue when it comes to making sure that parental programs are sustainable for the long haul. And lastly, interventions should be focused on preventing child abuse, which is a really important factor. All right, the report, as I said, looked at parenting programs in the Arab region. Here, I wanna show, uh, show you a snapshot of the different findings that were specifically targeted towards the Arab, uh, Arab parenting programs or parenting programs in the Arab world. They found that these parenting programs included capacity building, family counseling, protection from domestic violence, and they looked at problematic behavior management, as I talked about in the, in the previous slides. And the objectives of these kinds of programs involved enhancing family care worker skills, improving family awareness, and providing parental care knowledge and training. The target groups involved families, mothers, fathers, parents, as well as family care workers, so people in the service industry. This is really important to know. However, it also found that there were a few gaps that needed to be responded to. One, the absence of youth and adolescent related issues. And this is a key highlight that I'm gonna come back to in the, in the future slides in my presentation. Furthermore, we found that a gap was included low attendance, lack of father participation, lack of standards in the implementation of these different programs, weak or vague theoretical frameworks, as well as poor evaluation of these programs for future reference. The challenges, however, involved conflict between pro program times and work times. A lot of parents found that it was tough for them to attend these different programs and uh, trying to reconcile their work lives and their social lives and attending these programs at the same time. There was a lack of a prevention program model, as well as long-term funding to keep these programs going. In addition, there was weak reach for children with disabilities or families that had children with disabilities, so it didn't target them or didn't look at their, the kind of vulnerability that they face, as well as poor documentation and poor impact evaluation. It's really important to note that looking at the, the successes and looking at the weaknesses of these programs is really important for the longevity of these programs. All right, three minutes, noted. So what about parenting programs, whoops, 
one sec. So what about parenting programs focused on youth and adolescents? There are few evidence-based parenting programs available for parents and caregivers of adolescents that have been evaluated. And most of these come from high income countries like the US, the UK, Australia, such as Triple P and others. So why should adolescents and youth be targeted by these parenting programs in MENA? This is because there's a youth bulge, there's a high risk of violence and conflict, there's engagement in, risk, in risky behaviors, there's a lack of employment opportunities in the MENA region, a lack of civic engagement and participation and exposure to online violence and risks. Therefore, there's an urgency to address the needs of this age group. As such, what can governments, private sectors and young people do to support youth? One, increase funding for early childhood development. And I believe Enrico touched on this point before. And this includes adequate health, nutrition and responsive stimulation to build the foundation of children's physical and emotional and cognitive development. Two, basic improve basic education and simultaneously nurture the skills needed to match the rapidly changing economy. This includes training. Three, provide more support for young people transitioning from education to employment. Four, improve education quality to equip children with the skills critical for their future, including critical thinking, communication, as well as empathy. And five, provide children and young people with spaces to raise their concerns, share their ideas, and engage them in the decision-making process. All right, but what about the role of families? The MENA region has the highest youth, of un, uh, youth unemployment rate in the world, reaching 30% in 2017. And this in includes a regional average of up to 40% among young women. According to the expert group meeting that was held in Doha on the impact of families and family policies on youth transitions, some of the key highlights involved looking at parenting and uh, parenting's influence on youth transitions. This involved looking at parents as a key resource for Arab youth. This included educational support as well as employment support. Sorry about that. Educational support in terms of family advice, enabling access to opportunities and pushing women to work in, in certain fields. Employment support also includes families having expectations for their youth to work in certain fields as well as earn certain wages, which affected the way what they chose to do. And lastly, it's important for, uh, for, uh, to strengthen parent-youth relations to support youth transitions. And according to one of Diffie's report on Arab family strengths, we found that responsibility, support, good communication, respect, love, and conveying traditions, as well as resilience, need to be nurtured and protected and supported in order to strengthen the relations between parents and their youth. So lastly, I want to provide a few recommendations uh, for us to, all, to think about and uh, comment on. It's important to note that we need to implement early parenting interventions. We need to ensure that parenting interventions are evidence-based. We need to target adolescents and youth, not only children. And we need to establish and implement systems for long-term service provision. In addition, we need to provide support for at-risk families and continue to provide them with support no matter their circumstances. Further, we need to raise parents' awareness on positive parenting and, and form networks of support for these youth and coordination between governments and NGOs, and adopt program criteria, program evaluation, and risk assessment, including parenting issues and policies. So thank you so much for giving me the time to uh, give my presentation. If you'd like to contact me or look at Diffie's research or access Diffie's report, you are more than welcome to email me or visit Diffie's website directly. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Heba, for your insights. Now we have a couple of questions here maybe more than we will be able to, to address. So let's try it. Let's see how it goes through here. So I have a, an interesting question from Jose Ricardo here from Brazil, Brazilian fellow. Uh, he asks us, taking into account the raising of social entrepreneurs initiatives that enter development and implement solutions for social issues, do you think it is possible to address youth issues with government policies in alliance with social entrepreneurs initiatives? If yes, how could it be done? So first, please, Enrico, maybe you have some thoughts and then I'll give the floor to Heba to compliment. Okay, Rodolfo, first of all, I would like to, to thank and congratulate Heba for uh, the, uh, 